seen, of course, Abraham, and then we've seen Isaac, and then we've seen Jacob, and now guess who? Joseph. Joseph. Wow. We don't have that many more lessons left to go, you know. We're, we're getting toward the end. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. We're seeing, we've seen the lives of four key men who were the fathers of the nation of Israel. Abraham and Isaac, Jacob. They're really the patriarchs. We, can, we throw in Joseph in there because there's a lot about him in the book of Genesis. And we wanted to just see all of these people. So we've looked at this. I called Abraham, if you notice, I called Abraham the what? the man of faith. We called Isaac the quiet man. I called Jacob the wild man. And then now we've, we've come to Joseph. And I think Joseph could be called the faithful and forgiving man. Now, when you look at his life, to be real honest, uh, there's some things in there you might say, Joseph, you might not have should have done that. But then at the same time, you really don't see sin in Joseph's life. And Joseph has been called a lot of times as a picture of Jesus Christ. And, and he, he, tr- he, he trusts God in the events of his life. He serves God. He is blessed by God. Joseph has often been called, at this, we call it Joseph, from the pit to the palace. And the pit, of course, is he gets put, he gets thrown in a, a thing, uh, you know, a cistern, and he gets sold off, and he ends up being in prison, and then he ends up being number two, being the, the number two in all of Egypt, which you, you'd say, how is that even possible that a person be a slave and end up being number two in all of Egypt? So we're going to see it. Tonight we start with Joseph and his relationship to his brothers, and uh, we'll see how this fits together. And I've got three big areas that we're going to look at. We're going to see section one, he's hated by his brothers. Number two, he's sold into slavery. And number three, Potiphar's wife and prison. And we'll see how that ties together. There's a lot there. Well, let's start with this. How do we, do, how do we respond when things go wrong? When it, and it's not our fault. We didn't do anything. We've done everything we can do, and things go wrong. Sometimes we're just mad. Sometimes we complain. And sometimes we trust God. He's in control. As we look at the life of Joseph, this is what we see. We see a man that when everything seems to go wrong, I mean, every time something happens, it seems to go wrong, or somebody does something to him, and he lives a life that he just trusts God and is faithful. In fact, all at the end, when we get close to the end of the book, what does he say to his brothers? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so when we look at our lives, we can say there are things that come in our lives that are not good, and yet we, and, and maybe somebody even means it for evil to hurt us, and yet God will take it and use it for good. He always does that. And we see the life of Joseph. We see, feel, see a man filled with things that go wrong, and we put it this way. He's in the pit, slavery in prison, in the palace, second to Pharaoh. So let's start with hated by his brothers. There it is, Genesis 37. He's hated by his brothers. We think somebody so faithful and forgiving would not be hated, but you know what? There, there are some great people that other people just hate them. And you think, why would they hate that person? You know, that kind of thing. So let's look at Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob, we go back to Jacob. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. So we go back and he, uh, he's given us the end, basically, because we've been seeing Jacob. And suddenly we're going to change as we're in chapter 37. We're going to change from Jacob to Joseph. Now Jacob's still going to be in the picture. But Joseph is going to be sort of the one coming there. And it goes on, he says, these are the records of the generations of Jacob. And he, and he skips. And he says, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to his father. Now, all of a sudden, we, we just, we've gotten out of nowhere. Jacob is talking, and then suddenly it says, Now, Joseph was 17. Do you know how old Joseph was when he was raised up to power in Pharaoh's court? Anybody know? 30 years old. How old was Jesus when he began his ministry? 30 years old. And so we'll, we'll, we'll think about this. So Joseph is 17 years old. He does not know what the next 13 years of his life are going to be like. You know, one time I've had people say, I just wish I knew what was going to happen. I said, no, you don't. 
You don't want to know that three weeks from now you get the flu and you're going to be sick. You just don't want to know about that. You, just take it as it comes. And so they're all out there. Now notice what's happening right here. It says, uh, Joseph was 17 years old. He was pasturing the flock with his brothers. They're all out there. While he's still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. And Joseph, now watch the end of verse 2. Joseph brought a bad report about them to their father. Now, what would we call him? A tattletale. What? He, but this mic keeps going on and off, by the way. I'm not sure unless there's some... Yeah, I, it, I think it's connected, but it just keeps kind of fading in and out. That was, that was a great sneeze. It was one of the best sneezes I've ever heard. That was amazing. Okay, uh, if it goes in and out, well, just let me know. But anyway, so he gives back a bad report. Why? Well, and well some could say, well, he just went and told on them. But there's most likely something evil that they may have done. Maybe they stole something. Maybe they lied about something. We just don't know. It looks like it's a tattletale, but it brings back a bad report. The brothers had done something bad. So look at verse 3. Now, Israel, who's Israel? That's Jacob. They're using his name. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. So now what we get here is that Jacob favored Joseph. What happens when, that ha when you have that? We already saw what happened to Jacob and Esau and the favoritism all there. We saw it all the way back. Whenever there's favoritism, there's going to always be problems. And so Jacob has, has favored Joseph, and he made this... Uh, very colored tunic. By the way, the Hebrew word is a real rare word. Some people say it means uh, multicolored, you know, and everybody's talking Joseph and his multicolored coat and all that stuff. We're not even sure what the word actually means. It just means it was really some kind of unique coat or some kind of unique something that he gave him. And so he, he loves him more than all the other sons, and he gave him this tunic that he wore that was better, be, basically better than anybody else's. Now let me ask you something. Do you think the other sons knew that he was favored? Of course. I mean, and what happened? Let me just say this. What happens to the one that's favored from the ones that aren't favored? They, they don't like him. I mean, they, you know, naturally, sometimes people are this way that we don't like the person that got, gets favored. And we go, that's not fair. That, what do kids say all the time? That's not fair, you know? And, and so they, look at verse 4. It says, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him. They would not speak to him on friendly terms. So they hated him, and they wouldn't speak, and they, well, they wouldn't speak in a good way. There's always a problem when there's favoritism in a home, and we saw it in Jacob and his wives and sons. I mean, think about this. This is the family, but everybody knows that Jacob loves who the most? Besides, we're talking about, right, you know, he loves her. I mean, everybody knows that. And he knows that the, the handmaidens are just there that produced him children. And and we know that Leah is not really loved. And so and now you've got all the boys, the twelve boys and one girl, and out of the twelve boys, uh, of course we hadn't, we hadn't got the you know we the, one of them is favored above everything else. And so look what happened. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now he had this dream, and they hated him. And God gave the dream to Joseph. Listen, I want you to understand that God gave the dream to Joseph. And so uh, it, it, it's a special dream, and it's symbolic. And when he told them, they hated him more. So he goes on, listen, he, get, he gives us the description. He said to them, please listen to the dream which I had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect, and the rest of your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. What is he telling them? You're going to all bow down to me. I'm the top dog. Now, we say that Joseph, best we can tell, uh, he doesn't look like he ever does really anything wrong. He's only, but, you know, maybe you shouldn't have told him the dream. You know, uh, he's going to have another dream, and his father's going to say, do you think we're all going to bow down to you? Well, the truth is, yeah. And uh, so he says, think about this dream. And, 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 and my sheaf was up, and everybody else's bowed down. And we know that this, what was the dream? Joseph would be the ruler of the brothers. Now, is there a time that the brothers all bow down to him? Yeah. When is that? That's when? They don't even know it's him, right? They don't know it's him. 
They're in Egypt, and they think there's an Egyptian telling them what to do, and they're bowing down before this Egyptian. They don't realize they're bowing down to Joseph, just like it was promised, just like it was promised. And so look, it goes on in verse 8 and says, His brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or, or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Well, first of all, he got him into trouble because they did something wrong and he went and told his daddy. And his daddy favors him above everybody else. And then he has this dream that they're all going to bow down to him. And he says, I, they're, they're, we're not going to bow down to you. And so how did his brothers react to this dream? Did they understand what the dream meant, that Joseph would rule? They did. No, they did understand. He does have, He has another dream that he relates to his father, and they said, no, no, no. Look at verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept, saying, kept the saying in mind. What did Jacob think? Something is from God here. Something is from God here. Now let me ask you something. Out of all of the brothers, all of the sons... To whom is the kingdom going to come and the Messiah? To who? Judah. Judah. Yeah, Judah. Judah. And, and, uh, and where's the priesthood going to come? Levi. 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 Okay. And uh, where's the double portion going to come? Yeah, you got to think about this one for a second. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. That's the double portion. So, remember, uh, 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 main, the main one, the main son, would get the priesthood, the double portion, and the blessing. But it's divided among three because we're going to find we're not going to study it. But Judah did something really bad, and so he lost a lot of the blessings. Only coming through Judah was the kingdom, and Levi got the priesthood, and Joseph got the double portion. Okay, so they hated him even more, and, and did they understand the dream? Yes, they understood the dream. And verse 11 again says, His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. I think his father knew. Now, let, let's talk about something just for a second. Um, oh, let me, let me see. Oh, yeah, they hated him. And, uh, so where is the choice? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, here we go. So his brothers hated him. Why? Because he told on them because he was the favorite son, and because he had this dream. Okay? Now, under, under this, there's the grace, mercy, and think about this. Why did God pick Joseph? Okay, let me ask you this question. Why did God pick Jacob? Why did God pick Isaac? Why did God pick Abraham? Because they were really great, right? No. In fact, they weren't that great. That's called grace, mercy, and love of God. Uh, God does his thing and does things for people and picks people to do things for him, not because of what they do, but because of his grace and mercy. Think of God's choice of Joseph. It's an act of grace. Think about it. What did Joseph do to get picked by God to do all of these things? To, basically, do you realize Joseph saved the nation of Israel. And Joseph saved all of us because if the nation of Israel would have perished, there would be no Messiah. Joseph saved us all. That's why he's a picture of Christ. He's a picture of the Savior. And so when you think about grace is getting what you do not deserve, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and justice is getting what we do deserve. Now, uh, let's think about grace for salvation. In God's grace, he gives us eternal life, right? What do we have to do for it? What do we have to do? Absolutely nothing. I mean, it's, we, um, when I say believe, believe is not a work. We, you receive the gift. And then mercy is not getting what we deserve. What we, get, we don't get death. Think about that. We're supposed to die, but we don't get it. And justice. Now, think about this. You do not want justice. You do not want to say, I want justice, because if you got justice, you're going to be separated from God forever, because justice demands we die, but God in His grace gives us the salvation, and in His mercy, He does not give us death. God poured out His justice on Jesus. The justice of God was poured out on Jesus Christ. The grace and the mercy of God is poured out on us. We need to be thankful for that. That's so powerful. Okay? Question? You want to go back, did you say, or what? Yeah. One back, this one? No, 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 one more. Back 
Oh, three of them? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Justice is getting what we do deserve. But you don't, we don't want the justice of God. Okay? We want God to pour out his justice on somebody else. And he did on Jesus Christ. So, in God's grace, he gives us salvation. His mercy, we get. We, not in death, we get salvation. And justice is poured out on Jesus Christ. So now, what happened? Notice we're now going to see an event that's going to change all of history. And let's see what happens. And his brothers went to pastor their father's flock in Shechem. So they leave to go. Now, why doesn't, uh, why doesn't Joseph go with them? Huh? Well, I mean, uh, is, is it not gonna, is it going to be hard work to go out there and take care of the flock and everything? Out in the sun and the night and the cold and the heat. And who gets to stay home? Just, okay, yeah, the favored one. Now they go to, to the, they went to Shechem. Look at verse 12. It says, the brothers went and pastored the flock, uh, flock in Shechem. Let me give you an idea. They've been down in here, Bethel, house of God, and all this stuff. And they, they all leave and go up to Shechem. Apparently there's just better stuff there. And what, what the father does, and what you know, this is pretty normal. It says, Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said, okay, I will go. And why is he sending them? He said, well, I want you to go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. And so he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So the valley of Hebron, which really could be way down. Let me see if I can push this right by. Probably way down there. So they went from there. They'd been at Bethel. They'd been around this area. Uh, you remember they were back and forth in here. They'd been in Hebron, so they go all the way to Shechem. And then he says, I want you to go up there and, and, and find out what's going on. How are they doing? And that's pretty normal, too. And he says, I'll be glad to go. Notice he doesn't, he doesn't say, I don't want to go. He says, oh, I will go. Go see about the welfare of your brothers, the welfare of the flock. Send word back to me. Now, let me ask you this question. So you're the brothers, and how do you feel about him? You don't like him. And he, he's now coming. You see him coming. What do you think he's going to do? He may go back and tell Dad what? Oh, they're not doing good. Oh, they're lazy. Oh, they're not doing stuff. Because you never know what this guy's going to say because he turns around and tells Daddy bad stuff about us. At least that's what they think. So look what happens. What was the plan? Now, here, so verse 12, um, verse uh, 15. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man said, who are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are, Pastor and the flock. Then the man said, oh, they moved from here. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. I'm gonna go. So notice they, they started off and they went to Shechem. And now they've gone all the way up to Dothan. And so he came and he was looking for them because he said, I'm in Shechem. And he's looking around. And the guy said, well, who are you looking for? He said, looking for my brothers. He said, oh, I know who they are. I heard them say they're going to Dothan. So he said, okay, I'll go to Dothan. I'll go up there. And so uh, verse 17 says, then the man said, oh, they, they went to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers. They found them at, at Dothan. Now look at verse 18. And when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. Look, when they saw him coming, when they saw him coming. Now, I've got, I'm going to put it this way. I'm going uh, I'm to call this plan A. <laughs> plan A. What are they going to do? Kill him. Kill him. Well, how do you think that'll go over? How are they, have they thought about this? How are you going to kill him? And then go back to daddy and say, we killed him. They're not going to say that. So how are you going to kill him? This, this is the plot. And they said they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. He's making these dreams. He said, we're going to all bow down before him. Well, I'm not bowing down before him. I can tell you one thing. In fact, the best way what we could do with this guy is to get rid of him. Because he's nothing but trouble. He's the favored one. He's got the good-looking coat. He's got everything. He's got everything. His dad lets him get away with everything. It's just not fair. And so we're going to deal with him. Here comes that dreamer. Now, now then, verse 20, uh, come and let us kill him. Throw him into one of these pits. And we'll just say a beast devoured him. Then let's see what becomes of his dream. So we're going to kill him, and we're going to say that an animal ate him. <laughs> 
That's what we're going to say. This is the plot. We're going to kill him. And that'll put the end to these dreams and it'll put the end to all this junk that he always says. So what was their plan when the brothers, they said, we're going to plot, we're going to put him to death. Here comes the dreamer. Let's do it. Um, what I read some studies that in Dothan, there were supposedly two cisterns, two big cisterns. You know what a cistern is? That's where they collect water. And there were supposed to be two that were there. That's what I've read. And so that's why they saw him and said, we can just throw him in one of these pits. Now watch what happens. Verse 21. But Reuben. Who's Reuben? Who is he? He's the oldest one. Now, who's kind of who's kind of in charge and watching out? Reuben. Reuben's responsible. Daddy would say, Reuben, you know what to do. You're the oldest. So look what happens. Then Reuben heard this when he heard that they were going to kill him. And he, he said, and he rescued him out of the hands and said, well, let's not kill him. Let's don't kill him. Uh, Reuben further said to them, let's don't shed blood. Let's throw him in the pit. Okay, here's B. We're just going to put him in the pit. We're going to put him in the pit. And what will happen if he stays in the pit and can't get out? He'll eventually starve to death. Or, you know, so that's the plan. And he says, well, let's just, uh, Reuben says, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him into the pit. Uh, throw him into the pit in this wilderness. Do not lay hands on him. Now watch the rest of the verse. That he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So what was, throw him in the pit, but what was Reuben's plan? He was going to save him. And he was going to take him back to who? To dad. And what do you think he thought was going to happen when he takes him back to dad? He, who knows? I might now be second favored, you know, out of all of this, you know. Uh, that, that's the plan. I, I, you know, so he said that the oldest brother speaks up and says, no, let's don't kill him. Let's, let's throw him in the pit. And, and, uh, this, this is what the best thing that we can do. Now, let me, I put this here again. Uh, why did they hate him so much? The plan is to rescue him. Let's not kill him. And so he's going to rescue him. But why did the brothers hate him? Well, Joseph told on his brothers, favored by their dad, given a special coat, and he had the dreams that they would all bow down to him. And so they, they, they do not like him. Now, let's just say, so, when you look at the scripture, does Joseph come across as a really great person? He doesn't? Huh? Every time I see him, they, they uh, throw him in a pit. He gets taken off in the thing, and he, he works for Potiphar's, you know, Pot and he's amazing. Then he gets thrown into prison. He works, and he does amazing. And he comes out of prison, and he goes number two, and he's amazing. His brothers all come. He's amazing. Everything I see of him is amazing. Now, the first part of his life, it appears to be that he's one of those that say exactly what he thinks. You guys are in trouble. I'm telling on y'all. I mean, you know, and, and I mean, it just may be his personality. But it, it, do you see any sin in his life at this stage? Do you see, if you've read it, have y'all read the rest of the book? Have you, do you see any sin in Joseph's life? Huh? He's amazing. He's pretty amazing. And I think that's why a lot of people, and we'll look at it as we go a little further on, that Joseph is called a type of Christ. He's a picture, a foreshadow of Christ. Well, what, what is the, the, uh, the plan? His the plan is he's going to come back and rescue him. Let's throw Joseph in the pit and we'll come back and, and we'll pl plan to come back and rescue him and Dad will reward him. That's what I think he's thinking. So plan A, let's kill him. Plan B, no, let's throw him in the pit, and I'm going to come get him after they throw him in the pit, pull him out of the pit, take him back home, and then I'll just have to tell them that, I'll have to tell Dad that they, they were really mad and they wanted to kill him. But I, I stopped it all, you know, and, and I just want you to know that I, I stopped it all. So, so what did they see coming while all this has happened? So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers, what happened? They stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and they threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty and without any water in it. So they did exactly what plan B was. Let's throw him in the pit. And where's Reuben? Reuben's gone for a while. Reuben leaves. Reuben probably says, okay, well, they'll, they'll throw him in the pit. I'll go somewhere. I'll come back later when they're not watching. I'll pull him out. That'll be the plan. Um, so it looked like a good idea. When they sat down to eat a meal, 
And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites were coming from Gilead with their camels bearing Aramaic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. So they're, they're coming. Uh, they look up and there's a caravan of Ishmaelites. And they're coming through. And they're, they're, these are descendants of Ishmael. That's why they're called Ishmaelites. And they're coming and they're on their way to Egypt. And so they get an idea. Verse 26. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Hey, I got a better idea. We don't have to kill him. I'm calling this uh, B2. <laughs> Because we're going to have a part C in a minute. A B2. And a B2 is, well, let's don't kill him. He's in the pit. And, and there's no sense in killing him. And what he's in the pit, what we could do is this. What point is for to kill our brother and cover up the blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. He's our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listen to him. He said, listen, here's what we can do. Is we can just sell him. And see, then we could say we had nothing to do with his death. We don't really know what. And we're not lying. We don't really know what happened to him. And after he left for the Ishmaelites, how are we going to know what happened to him? This is a good deal. We can just say, we don't know what happened to him. We just don't know. And so, here's what happened. And so they're going to sell him off. And so, verse 28, Then some Midian traders, that's the Ishmaelites, Midianites, traders passed by, so they pulled him up, lifted Joseph out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. They ultimately, that's what they're going to do. 20, 20, they saw him come to Ishmaelites, descended to Ishmael. They sold him 20 pieces. By the way, the price of a slave or a young boy was about 20 pieces of silver. So that's what they did. They sold him. And then it ends, this verse ends by saying, thus they, they took him on down to Egypt. So we already know what's going to happen to Joseph. He's going down to Egypt. Wow. And this is God's plan. This is God's plan. See, sometimes things happen to us, and we say, why is this happening to me? And all you can say is, obviously this is what? God's plan. We just don't always see it. We can't always grasp it. We don't always know what's going to happen. Uh, if you remember, in Genesis 15, do you remember the promise to Abraham? What did he promise him in Genesis 15? Back to chapter 12, back to 12, land, seed, blessing. And then chapter 15, land, seed, blessing. But he said something in there. He said, your descendants will be slaves in a country. And I will bring them out with great wealth. Now, how many of them are there? There's 12 guys and one girl and four women and Jacob and then this household. But how many family people are there? If you want to count all four, you know, for all four women, that's 16, 17, 18. There's like 18 people. That's the nation of Israel. <laughs> 18 people. They're going to go down to Egypt. And when they go down to Egypt, there are going to be 75 of them. And when they come out, there's going to be 2 million. They go down as a family. They come out as a nation. What was the promise to Abraham? I will make of you a great nation. So that's what's going to happen. So they sold him. Well, Reuben, who obviously went to get a Reuben sandwich, as that's where he's been, that's why he missed out on everything. So Reuben comes back, verse 29. Now Reuben returned to the pit. He went to go get in the pit to get Joseph out, and he went, he's not in here. Now, Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. He tore his garments. He went, oh, my gosh. Who's, who's responsible? He is. He's the oldest one. He's the, he's, the, he's the guy. And he's going, oh, my gracious, what am I going to do? He said he returned to his brothers and said, the boy's not there. As for me, where am I going to go? He said, the boy's not there. What am I going to do? And basically, he, he returns. And what does he do? As the elder, elder, oldest, he was responsible. That's when he says, where am I going to go? He's saying, what am I, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? How am I going to go back to Father and say, what did y'all do? And they told him, I'm sure, well, we thought it'd be better than killing him. And so we just thought it'd be best to sell him into slavery. Just let him go. And that way we can say, we don't know what happened to him. We didn't, 
We didn't have anything to do with what happened to him. Wow. So they're going to come up with plan C. And that's to say, going back to here, uh, obviously an animal ate him. And see how they're going to pull that one off. Well, they've already took off his what? His coat, and so look what happens. So they took Joseph's tunic, and they slaughtered a male goat, and they dipped the tunic in the blood. So they made it look like that he has wearing his coat, and uh, something ate him. You know, something ate him. And so when they come back, what do they do? And they came and sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father. They take all the way back to Jacob, and they said, We found this. Please examine it. Now notice how they say this. We found this. Please examine it. See whether it is not your son's tunic or not. They don't say our brother. They say your son. So they 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 just that's it. They question Jacob. Look, is this your son's? What do you think Jacob thought? Oh my gosh. Oh my gracious. Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, mourned for days for his son for many days, and all the sons and daughters, there's other people around, to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, I'm going to go down to my grave to Sheol in mourning. So his father wept. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And so they, they deceived him. They said, the beast has eaten him. They deceived Jacob. Now, by the way, they deceived Jacob. What has Jacob done most of his life? Deceived people. I mean, he's tricked everybody, and then he got tricked, and then he's tricked. Have you noticed the pattern? If you trick people, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get tricked back. You know, be not deceived. God is not mine. Whatever you sow, you what? You reap. He's been putting in most of his life deceiving people, and now it's coming back to him, and he thinks his son, the, the best one of all, is is dead. Wow. Wow. He thinks he's dead. And he's not going to be comforted. And by the way, he says, I'm going to go down. So let's see. Well, surely I'll go down to Sheol. Y'all know, y'all know about Sheol, right? Everybody understands. In the heart of the earth. There's a place in the heart of the earth right now. In the Old Testament, it was called Sheol. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. It's a place in the earth. There is one side which used to be called Abraham's bosom. The other side is just, we say, torments. There's a big gulf in between. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus teaches this. And that people who were believers in the Old Testament, if they died, they would go down to Sheol. And they, if they were believers, they would go on the good side. We call Abraham's bosom. If they were not a believer, they would go into the heart of the earth and to Sheol. And it was on the side of torments. After Jesus died on the cross, paid for sin, and rose again, he went down there and he took all of the believers and he took them to heaven. And then it says after that, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And Paul says that this place was called paradise. He says paradise is now in the third heaven. So now when a believer dies, we don't go to Sheol. We don't go to Hades. We go to be with the Father. When an unbeliever dies, they still go to Hades and Sheol. That's why in the book of Revelation, at the very end, when the unbeliever raised, it says, and death and Hades gave up their dead. So he's basically saying here, uh, I'm, I'm going to go down to my grave and go into the heart of the earth and I'm going to be all sad and everything because I've lost my son. And then look at the very end again. So meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar. Well, who was this man? Pharaoh's off- officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Well, he gets down there and he, he sold to Potiphar. Now, this, is, this man is, he's way up there. I mean, he is the head of uh, of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. Whoa. I mean, this is big. This is big. So let's see what happens to him. And, you know, you could say, poor Joseph. It's not really what? It's not fair. What did he do to get sold into slavery? I mean, listen, slavery then wasn't the greatest thing in the world. Now, you could be outside being a slave. You could be inside being a slave. And, you know, in Egypt, we just, you never know. And so he's sold into slavery. So let's look at number two. And this, you have to skip a chapter uh, because we don't want to talk about Judah and Tamar. But just if you want to read that chapter on your own, you can. It talks about why 
Judah didn't get everything he was supposed to get, okay? So let's look over at verse at, at chapter 39, and it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So they get down there, and um, we're going to see what happens here. Let, let me, I'm going to look at something real quickly just for a second. Okay, so they get him down there, and God is with Joseph, even and even in all of this mess. In fact, I think this is this is one of the keys that we need to think about. Potiphar is the captain of the bodyguard of Pharaoh. That means he goes and has the presence with Pharaoh. And in Egypt, what was Pharaoh considered? A God. Do you understand that? That's why the death of the firstborn was so important because Pharaoh was considered to be a God and every one of the judgments, every one of the plagues that God brought on Egypt, every one of them was a judgment on the gods of Egypt. They worshipped the Nile, the Nile turned to blood. They worshipped the sun, the sun turned dark. They worshipped frogs, frogs jumped all over everything. They, 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 just all that. And they worshipped Pharaoh and Pharaoh son, who would someday be Pharaoh, was a god as well. And the god, true God eliminated all of the gods of Egypt. That's what it's all about. So Pharaoh uh, has Potiphar, who is the captain of the bodyguards. And, you know, if you were Joseph, let me ask you a question. If you were Joseph, how would you feel? What would you be thinking? All I've ever done is what my father asked me to do. I mean, I told on them because they did things wrong. And I mean, I have to admit that I, I, maybe I shouldn't have told that dream about they're all going to bow down to me. But I think that's from God, and I think someday they'll all bow down to me. I don't understand it because right now, nobody's bowing down to me. I'm bowing down to other people. But how would you feel? Would you think that God has abandoned you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever feel like God abandons you? Abandons you? Sometimes. Sometimes when things go wrong, we think, where is God? Do you remember the guys in the boat? And they were walking, and Jesus said, go to the other side, and I'll be there later. And they're out in the boat, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And they're saying, where is Jesus? Why did he send us out here by ourselves? And they look up, and he's walking on the water. And it says that he's walking as if to pass by. Hey, how y'all doing? You know, just think about it. They're going, what in the world? And, and so sometimes people think, maybe God's not with us. But you know what Hebrews 13 says? I'll never leave you or forsake you. What should you fear? He is there and he's always there. You understand that he is there and he's always there. And there's never going to be a time that God is not with you. And sometimes we think, uh, is he there? Is he, is he working in our lives? What's going on? But the truth is he's always there. Uh, the Lord is with Joseph and the Lord is with us. And... Uh, Every one of us in this room have been hurt, I guarantee you. If you've lived long enough, you've been hurt. If you haven't been hurt, well, you will. You will be. You'll be hurt by people. You'll be hurt by circumstances. There'll be things that will hurt you. And when that happens, you have to say, God is with me, even in the pain, even in those kind of things. I want you to think about through this passage, God is with Joseph. God blesses Joseph, and we see Joseph's faithfulness and stewardship. I mean, that's what we're going to see. It's always that way. Now, let's look. Let me let you write down those three things. God is with Joseph. God blesses Joseph and Joseph's faithfulness. Can you believe that you're going to be blessed as a slave? What happens to him eventually? Where does he get? Not to the end, but where's the next big step for him? What's going to happen to him? He's going to be where? Two in the What's going to happen after that? He's going to be thrown into prison. Uh, and, and God, does God want to bless him in prison? How do you get blessed in prison? I mean, think about it. Joseph is faithful. And that's stewardship. And let's talk. Are you ready? Let's look at this one. God is with Joseph. Look at verse 2. The Lord, <laughs> it's so perfect. The Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of, the, of his master, the Egyptian. Now think about this. He is sold as a slave, and, and uh, Potiphar says, Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you look 
pretty sharp. Well, I'm going to put you in charge of some stuff. Just take care of some of my stuff. Well, he's so good. God is blessing him. God's, God's with Joseph, and God's blessing him. And, and uh, it, it, it says successful. And by the way, notice that it's all capitals, the Lord, the personal God was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. How can you be successful as a slave? Because everything he did turned out good for who? Potiphar. And Potiphar said, whoa, wow. God bless, how has God blessed us? He's given us eternal life. He's given us power to live the Christian life. He'll never leave us or forsake us, all of these things. And so God is with Joseph. And then uh, it, made him, it, made his, it made him successful. Um, God blessed him. It made him successful. Uh, God blessed Joseph. Uh, and, and, and look at verse 3. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now, this is Potiphar, and Potiphar is already way up there. He's probably extremely wealthy and powerful, and he's the captain of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. And he realizes everything this guy does turns to gold. Everything this guy does turns out good. Everything he does blesses. Uh, he makes me money here. He makes me money here. He takes care of this here. Everything goes great. And he saw that God, he, Potiphar saw that God blessed Joseph. That's what it actually says. Notice it says it. His master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord had caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his what? personal servant. He just did wasn't in the house. He became a personal servant. And and watch the, the next verse. So Joseph found favor in his sight, became a personal servant, and he made him overseer, uh, uh, overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. Well, this is the, the third part. We see Joseph's faithfulness and stewardship. If you were a slave and you had been free, and now you're a slave, and now you're, you're serving somebody, would you serve that person full speed, or would you just mess around? Most of us might just say, I'm a slave, and I don't care. I just, uh, my life is, is, a, is a disaster. But no, that's not what Joseph did. Everything that Joseph did was good, and, and uh, God, God took care of him. And Joseph, it became the, the faithful steward. And he became what it was. And I want to put this down. Uh, Joseph became the steward. That's verse 4. And he was put in charge of everything. Can you imagine this Pharaoh's guards, main guy, turning over everything to Joseph? Well, it mayn't surprise you, but in those days, there were what they called house slaves. And many house slaves uh, were called stewards. And they handled all of the property and the family of the person that, they, that owned them. Many times the slaves were, were educated and they actually helped teach the family, the sons and the kids as they grew up. So he has put him in charge of everything. And what we see is his faithfulness. More of brothers required of stewards to be found what? Trustworthy, faithful. And what happens when you're faithful? What, what happens when we're faithful? When we stand before Jesus Christ, what does he say? Well done, good, and faithful servant. And, you know, we think, and, and, and sometimes, let's just say it this way. Sometimes you can serve God here, and you get blessed right now. And sometimes... You'll get the blessing when you stand before him. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So Joseph became the steward. And what is a steward? Stewardship is a wise use of master's possessions. Now let's talk for a minute about that. just for, and, and then we can uh, go on and get some more of the stuff. But uh, are we stewards? What, what do we have? But let, me, let me erase some of this. Everything you have comes from who? God. What about your life? What about every breath that you take? What about every aspect of your life? What about your time? What about your money? What about your possessions? What about just your life as a whole, your body? That Everything belongs to Him. Everything. And we realize that, and, and let me put this up. Let's realize everything we have comes from God. Sometimes people don't think that way. 
You know, I've used to a person. I used to talk to a person. He said, "What you're supposed to do is give." And they, this person taught tithing. I don't, te- I don't believe the Bible teaches tithing. But he was saying, "What you do is you give God His ten percent, and the rest is yours." I said, "No, it's not. All of it's His. All of it's His." And you can give away whatever you choose as you purpose in your heart, but it's not yours. It's His. Everything that we have comes to us from who? God. We have to realize that. We have to grasp that, that everything, and we're to use this all for His glory. So let's think about it for just a second. Think about this. First of all, our lives, 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Is, what do you not know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies, what? As living sacrifices. Who do our lives belong to? God, think about this, y'all. We all say things like, okay, I, I believed in Jesus Christ, and now I have what? Eternal life, and I'm saved. But are you a disciple? What is a disciple? A disciple is one who says, I want my life to count for Christ. Whose life is it? Who decides how long you live? God does. Who decides when you were born? What color your eyes have? Where are you going to be? Who decided that Joseph would be working for, for Potiphar? God did. God works all things. So, first of all, your life, your body, that's all. That's all His. And look at this, our gifts and talents. Who gave you spiritual gifts? Who gave you talents? Who gave you abilities? God did. We're, we're to use it. First Peter 4, 10, as each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's the stewardship, the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given you. What about our possessions? Matthew 25, 1 Timothy, he talks about, listen, don't, don't, put your, your inve- don't, don't put all your eggs and everything in these material things, but what you need to do is lay up things because all your possessions are just for what? Why did God give you things? To use them for His glory. Do you realize that? This is my car. Well, actually, it's God's car, and you need to use it for His glory. That's really how. And then look at our time. He says, redeem the time because the days are evil. You know what? You can get more money, but you can't get more time. The most valuable thing you have is your time. And that's your life. And what can we do with that? We're to use it for what? For the glory of God. Wow. Okay, so verse 5 uh, so it came about from that time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he so he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, why do you think he cared about the food? He didn't want to get poisoned by somebody. So he said, I'm, I'm still having, I'm still checking my food, but everything else, Joseph, it's, it's all for you. Wow. And now, Potiphar's wife. Wow. So if you're Joseph, how is your life now? Okay, it's not that bad. I mean, you, you're, live, you're in the household of one of the most powerful men in Egypt, and this man trusts you completely, and he's using you to basically, to, and you're being used by God to help this man and to do everything. And you don't know the end. You don't know why God has put you in Egypt. You, you knew that there were dreams about your family bowing down to you, but you don't know why you're there now. But what is he doing with the time that he has? He's faithful all the way. He's faithful all the way. And so now... We got an issue. Look at the next verse. Uh, th- well, uh, the very end of verse 6 says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Mm-hmm. That means he's kind of a handsome guy. And, and, and we're going to see what happens. But let me put something up here. Just because we're living for God doesn't mean we are exempt from temptation or problems. Listen, sometimes people say, well, I'm trying to live for God. I don't know why all these things are happening. Because just because you're living for God doesn't mean things like this won't happen. And so what, what happened? Verse 7. 
It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said to him, lie with me. Good night. She's kind of a bold one, isn't she? She comes up to him and says, hey, I like the way you look. You know, Potiphar's gone a lot. You know, if you're, a, if you're the captain of the bodyguard, you're gone a lot. And so I like the way you look. I think we should, think we should do something. And, you know, and, and look at verse 8 and 9. He said, but he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. He's put all that he owns in my charge. There's no one greater in the house than, than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do this great evil and sin against God? He actually has two things here. Pontius Pilate left it after him. He said, my master trusts me. I have respect for him. And this would be a sin against God. And so let me, I put a little deal. Is it right to have sex? The answer, yeah, it's okay to have sex. It says you, yeah, right, right. That's great, great, Drew. That's exactly right. So when we say, is it right to have sex? You can say, yes, but with whom? The only, only way you can have sex is to be, have sex with the person that you're married to. That's what Hebrews 13, 4 Hebrews thirteen four is it right to have, well sex outside marriage is wrong, and so Joseph says it. He says no, I'm not. I'm not going to. First of all, the master trusts me, and second, it would be it would be wrong. It would be evil. And so, how does he think about? How does Joseph think about sexual sin? It's against God. It's against others, and he must control self. All right. So now we get to where it really gets to the nitty gritty. Right? So what happened? Then the temptation is coming. In fact, the temptation continues. Notice day after day. 39 verse 10. As he, and she, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie, besi- to lie beside her or to be with her. She, she didn't do this one time and leave him alone. She did this day after day after day and look what he did he said he would not listen to her he refused to consider it he would not lie beside her and you know what she said come over here come over here on the couch and lie beside me come over here beside me and he would and he he would not be with her and he would not be with her alone notice it says it again joseph as she spoke to joseph day after day he would not listen to her he would not lie beside her or to be with her. And when he says to be with her, it doesn't mean that he wouldn't be in those... He just wouldn't be with her alone. He's done everything he can do to protect himself. Okay? And, and that I think that four things stand out, and I want you to see those four things. And, and I think that we, we can think about them ourselves. And the first one is this. He re- uh, four things stand out. Tr- trust will be broken when we sin and fail. He said, my master, trust me. Verse 8, but he refused to, to, to this to his master's wife because he said, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. He's put me in, in charge of everything that he owns. And therefore, nobody's greater than I am. He has not withheld ex- anything except me. He said, first of all, I, my master, trust me. If I do this with you, uh, then I will, I will lose. I will lose my master's trust. And I've, I put right here, that hey, my master trusts me. That's what verses 8 and 9 are saying. And when you sin, you break trust with people that know. You know. Yes. Well, put it back. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, one more? Go back even more? Okay. What, what do y'all want? Right there? Oh, okay. So he would not listen. He would not lie beside her. And he will not be alone with her. By the way, that's verse 10, just in case if you wanted to write out beside that, just verse 10. That's exactly what verse 10 says. So, he said, she would say, why don't you come lie with me? No. Why don't you come over here and lay beside me? No. Why don't you, let's just me and you be, no, I'm not doing any of that. And so he says, number one, let me get to it, four things stand out. The first one is, he realized trust will be broken when we sin and fail. He, did, he knew that his master trusted him. And he, he said, and let me put this up. He says, my master trusts me. I do, not, I do not want 
to lose that. The second thing that I've got, and I want you to see, and this is also verse 9, this would be against God. It would be evil. 39, 9 says, There is no one greater in this house than I. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against who? God. He didn't say sin against Pharaoh. I mean, I mean, Potiphar. And, and, and he could say that because that would be a sin. But he's saying, how, this is evil. This is evil. And I'm not going to do this. And then, verse 10, the third thing, he did not consider, do, do not consider sin. He, he says, I'm not going to consider it. He, he spoke to Joseph David. He did not listen, didn't lie beside her, didn't want to be with her. He said, I'm just not going to take any kind of chances. He's not going to allow the temptation to stay there. Now, let me tell you something. His job is where? It's in the house. His job, he's the head of the household. Potiphar's gone. She's there. And so every day that he goes to work, so to speak, uh, there she is. And every day she's tempting him. Now, what are we supposed to do? We, we said this. Number one, realize that trust will be broken. Realize it's, it's evil. Realize that we can't con even consider it. And, and, and by the way, you know, we can't stop necessarily temptation, but we, we don't have to be around it. Notice Luther said this, you can't stop the birds from flying around your head, but you can't stop them from making a nest. And, and basically he says, you know, temptation come, and you can't always stop temptation, but you can deal with it. And so this is why I think the, the, the last one, number four, is leave the situation. He left. He would not get caught with her. And so look what happened, verse 11. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work. This is what he normally does, right? Went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were inside. Where are they? Where could they all be? What do you think happened? I think she sent them all out. Don't you think so? I mean, she's the wife of the... Uh, I don't want you here. I don't want, I don't want anybody here. To, I want you here. I don't, and who comes in? Joseph. And you could see him going, where is everybody? Where's all the rest of the men? Where's all the rest of the men? And so she said, she caught him by his garment. Probably a, a coat, a little, you know, coat thing. Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. What did he do? He ran off. He left, fled. The key, oftentimes in temptation, is to flee it. Second Timothy two two says, "Flee youthful lust." You you have to get away. Sometimes, and you know the the passage says, "There's no temptation that's coming on Jesus, not coming to man, but God will provide a way of escape." The bottom line is, when the temptations come, sometimes the best thing to do is what. Just leave, get out, get away from whatever is there, turn it off, run away, do something. Uh, Swindoll said, don't try to peacefully coexist with temptation. Mm -mm. You can't. There's an old saying that said, many times believers flee temptation, then wait around the corner for it to catch up. <laughs> when think about Joseph, he ran out, and she had this thing. Now, uh, what do, you, what do you think he did? He went running out of the house and he went, I don't know what to do. What do you think she did? She said, that slave ran away from me. That slave doesn't want me. And so, what did she do? When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her household. These are the men she's been sent out. Now she's calling them to come in and she said to them, See! He has brought in a Hebrew, he, my husband has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. And he came into me to lie with me and I screamed. What do you, what, how do you feel when you read that? Does it make you so mad? You're just a liar. You've done everything wrong and now you're making it look like he did something wrong. You, you're just a liar. And so uh, she lied, she called him in. What did Potiphar's wife say? He tried to rape me. He tried to rape me, but I screamed. I screamed really loud, and that's what helped. Uh, and he came in and I screamed, and when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. Did he take off his garment? No, she, he was running away, and she pulled it off of him. And you know what? When they saw Joseph, did he have his top on? No. Whatever this garment was, it's, it's not there. And so she's saying, look what I have. He tried to rape me, and... 
uh, this is what happened. So I think she was embarrassed that he turned her down. I think she was really angry that he turned her down. So now what's going to happen? Oh, boy. Oh. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. What do you think Potiphar would do? He would what? What would he do to a slave that attempted to rape his wife? Kill him. Kill him. Now he also says, man, ever since that guy came, everything's been real good. <laughs> so look what happens. When she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to make sport of me, and I raised my voice and screamed, and he left his garment beside me and fled. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. He's really mad. He's really, really, really mad. And so Potiphar comes in. He's really mad. She told the story. Notice his anger burns. And what did he do? What did he do? He killed him, right? No. So Joseph's master took him and put him into jail, to the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. So I have some questions. What did Potiphar do? He put Joseph where? In jail. Why didn't he kill Joseph? Yeah. Well, had he seen Joseph's faithfulness? Did he still hope for some blessing? Did he totally... How many other people had Pharaoh's, had, had uh, Potiphar's wife gone after did he know her care, his char- her character? What, what, I mean, he's angry. Because if he didn't get angry, it would look bad for him. That he, he, what if he said, I don't care? No, that wouldn't work. So why didn't he kill Joseph? Well, number one, God wants Joseph alive. I mean, let's just think about it that way. God's plan is God, Joseph's going to stay alive because Joseph has got to save the nation of Israel. Joseph has got to save Right now, there's like 16 or 17 of them. But when they come in there, there's 75. Joseph has got to save the 75 people, which is the nation of Israel. Because through the nation of Israel is the Messiah. And if there is no nation of Israel, there's no Messiah. Joseph's got to be there. So God is going to protect him. No matter what happened, Joseph is not going to die. So why didn't he kill Joseph? Because he had seen his faithfulness. Because he maybe still hoped for some blessing. Maybe he thought, we'll let this blow over for a while. And then I can bring him back and my household can be blessed again. Or maybe, maybe he just didn't believe everything. But I want you to notice the next verse. Verse 21. But the Lord was what? With Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him What? Favor in the sight of the chief judge. So here he is. He gets thrown into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. He works for the, the guy named Potiphar. And before you know it, he's the number one guy under Potiphar. And everything's going great. He gets thrown into prison for something he didn't even do. And God is with him there. And extends kindness to him. And gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Now watch the next verse. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge of all the prisoners who were in the jail. So that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. And the chief judge didn't even supervise anything under Joseph's charge. Because what? The Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. We're going to see more on that next time. Everything that Joseph does, God does what? Blesses. He does it. He blesses him. Now, do you want to be in prison? Do you want to be a slave? And what does God do? He blesses him all the way through. Let me give you some, some of the, the, the Lord was with Joseph. Let's get some applications to quiz real quick and then any questions we got. But the first, let's realize that in God's grace we are saved. Just realize that. In God's grace we are saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is by grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Just remember that there's grace all the way through this whole thing. Every aspect and how God deals with us is by grace. Okay, the second one, let's understand the progression of sin. I mean, the brothers were angry at Joseph. Then they hated him. Then they they talked about the dreams. Then they actually wanted him dead. 
And so it started off with they didn't like him, and then eventually they wanted to kill him. And you just, you know, that's what's what happens in those kind of things. The third one is let's trust God, his plans will not fail. In the situations that go on in our lives, we have to trust him. Nothing can stop the sovereign plan of God. And so when things go wrong, in fact, uh, the next one, I'm going to put that up. When things go wrong, we just say, well, I, I don't understand it, but I'm trusting God. Because number four is let us know that God's always with us. He's always there. Uh, there will never be a time that we'll be separated. God is there. He is working in the events of our lives. And we just have to recognize that. And Joseph, obviously Joseph understood it. Because Joseph, wherever God put him, Joseph prospered. Wherever God put him, Joseph was a faithful steward. And that puts us to number five. And that is, let's be wise stewards of all that we've been given. Listen, what do you got? Time, money, possessions, life, abilities, uh, gifts, talents, ability, everything. That's all that God has given to you. Let's use it for his glory. This is your only life. This is it. Now, this life doesn't end. You have eternal life. And so you're going to go on forever. But this is the place that you serve him to get rewarded for the future. <clears throat> Let's live for him. Be wise stewards. The last one <clears throat> is uh, be ready for temptation. Be ready for temptation. It's going to come. And it could be all kind of temptations. It doesn't have to be sexual. It could be anything. In this passage, it was sexual. But there are other kinds of temptations that come into our lives. Understand that God desires our purity. That's what he wants us to be. First Thessalonians, this is the will of God. You are what? Sanctification. That is you know how to possess your own vessel. You, you abstain from sexual immorality. He desires purity. We've got a culture that whether you're... I just... In our culture, whether you're a believer or not, it almost doesn't matter. I, we see believers living together and having sexual stuff, with, and we see unbelievers. And it's almost like the culture just says, yeah, that's what you do. It doesn't matter. God desires our purity. Make the decision to obey God in sexual temptation because that's, that's what this passage was about. And it, it's wrong. It's against God. He says, how could I do this evil? How could I break trust? How could I do that? God is always with us.